First Brigade made great headway, moving up Water Street, Sophia Street, paralleling the Rappahannock River. There's a day when I can compete with that train. <laughs> You're doing great. You're doing pretty good. When the Irish Brigade moved down this road, they stopped again, right where we are. According to William McCarter, the brigade was in, soon again ordered forward from that last spot. But in a few minutes, another halt was made for the purpose of what I never heard. My regiment halted in front of some houses on Sophia Street pretty close to George Street. Now this corner right here is Hanover Street. The next block is George. That's important because the soldiers get them confused. But Carter did not because he lived here. So he knows that the brigade is stretched out from the tail of the column where he is, where we are, all the way into the next block, <coughs> near George Street. <coughs> this is important because both streets exit the city and go out to the Confederate line. But if we go out Hanover Street, there is one less block of the city to give us cover. It is a straight road, and if the Confederates land a shell on one end of it, it goes down the entire length of it. George Street is a little different. It's got a bend or a kink in it. It gives us more protection. Almost every Union soldier writes that they went out Hanover Street. They were wrong. They did not. And thanks to William McCarter, we know that. Because he doesn't even mention Hanover Street, he tells us about George Street. That's what's important. Now, he doesn't know why they're halted here, but we do. Because the first Union attack has failed. Union artillery has lined up on the edge of the city and is now bombarding the Confederates. But the Confederates have much better positions. They have been here longer. They have zeroed in on all of their tactical spots. And they deluge them. They smother the Union artillery. For they have much of a chance to assert themselves. As a result, there are cannons on the ends of these streets. Not destroying the Confederates, but drawing Confederate fire to us. Now, if the Irish Brigade is going to attack out of this city. They're gonna to have to go out one of these streets. If Union artillery is drawing Confederate fire, we're gonna suffer overwhelming losses before we ever get out of this city. So Hancock stops everyone on the city riverfront and rides out to the edge of town and orders the Union artillery to stop. Fire begets fire. And if the Union artillery stops, maybe the Confederates will range their fire elsewhere and allow these avenues to open up for our march. Make sense? It's going to take time. That's why we're going to be stuck here for 10 minutes. In the process, Confederate artillery is still pounding these streets and these houses. And the Irish Brigade starts to suffer casualties. William McCarter tells us about a shell that probably came right down William Street. We can forgive him his hyperbole because when a shell is headed straight for you, it takes on mammoth proportions. It's the biggest shell known to man. He wrote that a large round shell rolled quickly down the street. 
without bursting. And it passed through the vacancies of two of our regiments. So he's told you, we're on two sides of the street. And that show very probably kept going and found a home in the Rappahannock River. But that missile had scarcely disappeared when a much larger one, in fact, the largest I ever saw, its circumference apparently as big as a flour barrel. It struck a chimney on one of the houses right on the other side of the street. It hit the chimney about the center and very near which I stood. It knocked the chimney down on top of a row of low frame houses. And it came down with a terrible crash, crushing the structures below them. This stopped the progress of the shell, which then fell to the earth and rolled out into the middle of the street and burst right in the ranks of the 116th Pennsylvania. The commanding officer of the 116th is a colonel named Dennis Heenan. Dennis Heenan has never led his men into battle. He has now taken them about 500 yards towards battle. And he's one of those struck. A big piece of shrapnel from that bursting shell dashed up in his arm. But rather than leave his men, he just had the arm dressed. With a bandage, he stayed with his men. But Colonel Heenan has a double standard when it comes to these things. Lieutenant Seneca A. Willauer by an Irish name, <coughs> actually German. Lieutenant Seneca Willauer was wounded at the same time. A shell gashed his thigh, exposing the bone for four or five inches. That officer proceeded to limp over to Colonel Heenan and ask if he should stay with his men or report to the hospital. Colonel Heenan told him to go to the hospital at once. Nobody paid much attention to Heenan or Lieutenant Willauer. Because there was one other who was hit and fatally wounded here. And he drew everyone's attention. A sergeant with the last name of Marley. He's going to have the shell burst right in front of him. And the shell going to cleave his head clean off. It hit with such suddenness and shock that the body did not react at first and then slowly started to sink to its knees, propped up by his rifle in a kneeling position. It was one of the most unnerving things for these soldiers to see. Colonel Heaton immediately ordered Sergeant Marley's body removed from the street and taken down to the river, out of their sight. He did not want them to dwell on it. He didn't want them to think about it. After 10 minutes, <clears throat> Union artillery has stopped firing. And the Confederates have obliged by ranging their fire further to the south of the city. Nothing is coming down these streets now. It's clear, and the Irish Brigade can move on. Do you take the short Hanover Street, or do you take the covered, longer George Street? George Street offers a lot more chance of life, and that's what we're going to do. Now, when these guys move, once the Confederate artillery has stopped firing, there is a weird, eerie silence that prevails in this part of the city. According to a lieutenant colonel named St. Clair Augustin Moholland, the only thing you can hear going up through the city now is the steady tramp of the frogans of the soldiers 
and one disconsolate cat meowing. <laughs> and it was the cry of the cat that raised the hair on his neck. When we head into George Street, look at the ground in front of you. It rises for two blocks. And then it gets up onto a plateau at Princess Anne Street. It's the last bit of protection you will have. Once we get up on the plateau, we're gonna be a little bit more exposed. Once we get across the plateau, we're heading into open field and into a death trap. As we head up, we're gonna be going past that large steeple, St. George's Episcopal Church, the highest point in the city as it was in 1862. There is a church that said catty quarter to it, the Presbyterian Church. That's important because the soldiers don't know the name of George Street, not like McCarter. They think it's Hanover, but they tell us it's the street with all the churches. More churches out on George Street than ever on Hanover. Even if they get the name wrong, they're describing it for us, and we know where they go. So we're going to take advantage of their cover, and we're going to follow in their footsteps.